Good afternoon, Tech Nation. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We are excited to have over 470 registered attendees for today's webinar, which is eligible for 0.1 CE credits from the ACI. Let's get started by giving one lucky attendee a Tech Nation t-shirt for answering this trivia question. Which state is the only state to be named after a U.S. president? Answer now using the questions feature on your dashboard. While you're answering, I want to remind everyone to mark your calendars for MD Expo Irvine. It'll be held April 9th through the 11th. To receive more information about this and other upcoming MD Expos, including the educational lineup, schedule, and special events, sign up for our newsletter at mdexposhow.com forward slash Irvine. All right. And the winner of our Tech Nation t-shirt is Corey Robinson. Congratulations, Corey. The correct answer is Washington State. Tech Nation would like to thank our sponsor, Fluke Biomedical. Fluke Biomedical is the premier global provider of test and measurement equipment and services to the healthcare industry. They serve biomedical engineers, quality assurance technicians, medical physicists, oncologists, radiation safety professionals, and are continually expanding their range of solutions to broader, a broader range of healthcare and safety professionals. Learn more at flukebiomedical.com. Our presenters today are Jerry Zion and Andrew Clay from Fluke Biomedical. Jerry, you may begin whenever you are ready. All right, thank you very much. Well, gang, thanks for taking the time out today to be, uh, to be on this webinar and to learn a little bit more about uh, non-invasive blood pressure uh, monitoring and testing. We're going to review a little bit of the background about doing blood pressure monitoring and we'll cover the following agenda. Blood pressure overall, NIVP monitoring technologies that are currently in use, and NIVP monitor performance testing. How is blood pressure generated? When the heart pumps blood into the arteries, the blood flows with a force pushing against the walls of the arteries. The blood pressure in, is the product of that flow of blood times the resistance in the blood vessels themselves. Blood pressure is measured with a blood pressure cuff and recorded as two numbers, such as 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. The top larger number is called the systolic pressure, and this is the pressure generated when the heart contracts and pumps the blood it reflects the pressure of the blood against the arterial walls. The bottom smaller number is called the diastolic pressure. This reflects the pressure in the arteries while the heart is filling and resting between the heartbeats. Doctors have determined a normal range of both systolic and diastolic blood pressure after examining the blood pressure of many people. The following figures can be used as a guideline, and you'll see that on the next slide. Normal blood pressure being less than 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. High normal, which is between 120 over 80 and 140 over 90 millimeters of, of uh, pressure. A high blood pressure is considered to be equal to or more than 140 over 90. A very high blood pressure would be equal to or more than 180 over 110. Individuals whose blood pressure is consistently higher than this norm are said to have high blood pressure or hypertension. Uncontrolled high blood pressure is indirectly responsible for many deaths and disabilities resulting from heart attack, stroke, kidney failure, even type 2 diabetes is, uh, is affected by this. The only way to determine, though, whether you have high blood pressure is to have it checked regularly. Um, you guys are in, all of, all of us as biomedical engineers are in a really great situation because since we're testing these devices all the time, we're able to kind of keep track of our own blood pressure. However, our blood pressure, any one of us, is not traceable from a metrology point of view, so we are not appropriate test instruments. So we do need to monitor your blood pressure because it is a silent killer and we want you to all be healthy. So here are the 
norm, the normal, the high normal, the high, and the very high. When the arteries are full of plaque, the walls do not expand and contract very well. This leads to higher resistance and so a higher blood pressure. You may be interested in the recent studies that have been done about the effects of plaque, the reduction of plaque while it's still soft and is not hardened up, and the effects of uh, natural nitric oxide and the therapeutic nitric oxide to treat blood pressure and other chronic conditions. There's some really, really great stuff that's been going on. Very, very interesting, but you need to look at the peer review studies on these things. Let's look at how the blood pressure is measured. Blood pressure can be measured using a variety of techniques, which have been classified into two major categories, invasive blood pressure and non-invasive blood pressure. Invasive blood pressure requires a catheter, and it's uh, usually introduced into an artery of the test subject, unless we're doing venous pressure, in which case we place it in a vein. The catheter may contain a pressure transducer at its tip or it may be fluid filled and coupled to a blood pressure uh, transducer somewhere else. The change of the fluid pressure in the subject artery is measured invasively or directly. And this technique is also referred to as direct measurement as a result because the parameter being measured is directly coupled to the transducer. Non-invasive blood pressure involves the use of an inflatable cuff wrapped around the limb of the test subject, the patient. The cuff is inflated and deflated at a controlled rate and physical parameters are observed. The auscultatory and os oscillometric techniques are well known in non-invasive methods. These methods are indirect because they do not couple directly to the artery. Modern NIVP monitors now use oscillometric techniques to measure this pressure, and now instead of just measuring the, using the oscillometric technique on the deflation part of measuring the blood pressure, there are new techniques that are showing up in patient monitors that you may have even in your own inventory today that measure that blood pressure on the inflation of the cuff, um, more of a predictive kind of measurement. We were looking for better information about that to try and bring it to you this time. We did not find or were not satisfied with what we found. And so we'll come back with, a, with another uh, round of this topic later on uh, to give you a little bit more information about the measurement of the blood pressure on the inflation of the cuff. Auscultatory measurement is what doctors, nurses, paramedics, uh, and, uh, and others learn, and this is, how, this is how it's done. It's listening with a stethoscope to the brachial artery at the elbow. The examiner slow, slowly releases the pressure in the cuff. When the blood just starts to flow in the artery, the turbulent flow creates a whooshing or a pounding, and this is the first Karatkov sound. The pressure at which this sound is first heard is the systolic blood pressure. The cuff pressure is further released until no sound can be heard. This is the fifth Karatkov sound. And at the diastolic uh, arterial pressure is when it occurs. The auscultatory method has been predominant uh, since the beginning of blood pressure measurements, but is in some cases being replaced by other non-invasive techniques, like the os uh, oscillometric method. So oscillometric measurement, unlike uh, the auscultatory technique, uh, which was first used by Dr. Karatkov, sounds, uh, sounds to determine blood pressure. The oscillometric technique monitors the changes in the cuff pressure caused by the flow of the blood through the artery. The monitor inflates the cuff to a pressure that occludes the artery. Even when the artery is occluded, the pumping of the heart against the artery can cause small pressure pulses in the cuff baseline pressure. So depending on how sensitive the measurement system is, it can cause some problems and some false uh, peak pressures in that cuff. 
The monitor lowers the cuff pressure at a controlled rate. As the cuff pressure decreases, blood starts to flow through the artery. The increase in blood flow causes the uh, amplitude of the pressure pulses in the cuff to increase. Their pressure uh, pulses continue to increase in amplitude with the decreasing cuff pressure until they reach the maximum amplitude, at which point they begin to decrease with uh, the, the decreasing cuff pressure. The cuff pressure at which the pressure pulse amplitude is the greatest is known as the mean arterial pressure. And so um, it is actually the peak pressure in the cuff. There are lots of things that can mask this peak pressure or that can, over, uh, can override or overwhelm this peak pressure and could cause a false positive. For example, if the patient is riding in an ambulance on a bumpy road, those can create other peak pressures in the cuff and can cause problems. If the patient is shivering from, uh, because they're cold or because they're uh, recovering from inhalational anesthetics, uh, this can also cause some additional peak pressures in the, in the cuff that can mask it, the, uh, the, the original pressures. Or if they are a, a, cardiac, uh, a post-cardiac patient in a cardiac rehab lab and they're on the treadmill, the footfall on the treadmill can overwhelm the peak pressure in the cuff and it makes it very difficult to get that measurement. The manner in which the pulses vary is often referred to as the pulse envelope. The envelope is an uh, imaginary line that connects the peak of each pressure pulse and forms an outline. The shape of the envelope is observed by different monitors using a variety of different techniques to determine the diastolic and systolic pressure. The oscillometric monitors may produce inaccurate readings in patients with heart and circulation problems that, um, that occur like arterial sclerosis or things like that. Arrhythmias cause problems. Preeclampsia can cause problems. Uh, the pulses uh, alternons can cause problems as uh, pulse paradoxes. These all can create problems in the way that the patient monitor actually calculates and comes up with the blood pressure measurement. The amplitude of the oscillometric pulses is quite small when compared to the static pressure in the cuff, as shown in Figure 2. The, impulse, uh, the pulses appear as very small spikes on the cuff pressure waveform. They're de depicted in amplified form with the cuff pressure stripped, uh, stripped off to reveal how that amplitude varies as a function of the cuff pressure. The peak amplitude in, this, in the case shown is 2 millimeters at a cuff pressure of 115 millimeters. That would be the mean arterial or the peak pressure in the cuff. In general, the peak pulse amplitude is 1 to 3 percent of the cuff pressure at which it occurs. Therefore, the monitor must be able to strip off the large static cuff pressure to measure the individual pulse. Because the pulses are so small, it's possible for artifact conditions, as I've described already, to obscure that pulse. Patient motion and respiration are all common artifacts, as others that I've already described. So the manner in which the oscillometric pulses vary as a function of cuff pressure is open to interpretation. There is a couple of different general ways in which it's done in an algorithm, but those algorithms are all tweaked to match better up with the human uh, studies that are done uh, in, order to, uh, in order to get, for example, an FDA clearance to market uh, for those NIVP monitors or portions of monitors that are sold in the United States. So every algorithm is a little bit different. In practice, the different methods do not give identical results. An algorithm and experimentally obtained coefficients are used to adjust those oscillometric results to give the readings which match the auscultatory results that they are compared to. 
Some equipment uses a computer-aided analysis of the instantaneous arterial pressure waveform to determine the systolic mean and the diastolic points. Since many oscillometric devices are not, uh, have not been validated, you have to have, use a little caution uh, when, you're, when you're looking at those. So basically, there's two general uh, algorithm, algorithmic methods. One is the point slope uh, determination, and we've called this the height slope interpretation in figure three. The other one is more of um, once we get the mean arterial pressure, that is the peak pressure in the cuff, then we do a, a statistical analysis on it and we use standard deviations to the left and right of that peak pressure in order to determine the diastolic and the systolic pressures. And again, these are done mathematically. So to be clear, the oscillometric method measures the peak pressure in the cuff and then calculates systolic and diastolic, whereas the auscultatory method, the method where we're listening with a stethoscope, we would hear Krakow sounds that are equivalent to the systolic and the diastolic pressure, and we calculate the mean arterial pressure, just the opposite. So when you have a clinician, a doctor or a nurse who uh, complains that they don't feel that the blood pressure measurement is accurate, um, what, what they're really saying, they, what they may be doing is listening to uh, the blood pressure on a different limb, which will absolutely be different than the one that's being measured by the, the monitor, or they may be listening to a different measurement not the same measurement that they, that they felt was a problem. So one of the things I always try and do is get the clinician, the doctor, the nurse to make a measurement with the, the oscillometric uh, method, really occluding the, the blood pressure the, in the uh, artery, and listening while that auscultatory, I'm sorry, the oscillometric method is being, cal is being done almost invariably they will come up with something if not exactly the same as the patient monitoring system. They will come up with a, an auscultatory method, uh, method uh, blood pressure that is very, very close. And that usually takes care of the problem. So a little bit more about the height and the slope method. In the height method, that's the uh, point slope of basically a calculus method of doing this measurement. The peak pulse amplitude is treated as the mean arterial pressure, and it's normalized to a value of 100%. The cuff pressure at mean arterial pressure is the, is the mean arterial pressure. Systolic and diastolic are fixed percentages based on the mean arterial pressure. The cuff pressure under the diastolic the diastole is the diastolic pressure and the cuff pressure under systole is the systolic pressure. There is no standard to suggest what the percentages for systolic and diastolic should be, or even that they should be fixed percentages. Manufacturers using height-based uh, algorithms have performed their own clinical trials and drawn their own conclusion about what the percentages should be and whether they're fixed as a function of the mean arterial pressure or not. So the height method uh, is, the, is the figure three, the one to the left, which is the statistically, uh, statistically um, calculated method where we're using standard deviations. That, that's really what we're talking about with this fixed uh, uh, percentage left or right of the mean. So it becomes a bit of a problem and if the cuff picks the, a peak pressure that is not really the real peak pressure, either from the patient or from your simulator, dynamic simulator, it's going to give you a different reading than you expect, even if you're sending 120 or 80 from your simulator. In the slope method, there are many methods of, um, employed to determine how many slopes should be drawn. As I said, this is a a, an algorithm that is based in calculus, point-slope method and calculus. So 
what can what conclusions can be made about uh, about their intersection depends on how many slopes you're going to use. As shown in Figure 3, the cuff pressure under the inter intersection of the slopes is treated as the systolic and the diastolic pressures. There's no standard for the slope algorithm, and uh, just as there's no standard for height algorithms. So it makes it a little bit difficult from one patient monitor brand and model to the next as to uh, exactly how their, the blood pressure is going to be determined. So we, uh, we try and stick really close to the, uh, making the measurements as required under the standards under any ANSI SP10, the current version, or the IEC 60601-1-2-30. Either of these are really good foundations, and they set up the requirements for assessing the accuracy of the blood pressure and the way that the, the um, systolic and diastolic pressures will be, um, the information will be provided so that the uh, clearance to market can be provided by the FDA. That's really what we're saying here under the GMP um, uh, good manufacturing practice from the FDA. So um, there is good evidence that the best way to make sure that the system that's doing the measurement is accurate is to measure the system first before worrying about anything else. So how do you do that? Well, you do that using static pressure levels and a static pressure level comparison. The problem is in the patient monitoring systems, because of the clearance to markets and the safety part of performance and safety testing, and that includes the design validation testing that the manufacturer is responsible for, you need to be able to seal whatever the vessel or the thing that you're going to inflate is. So if, the, if we're going to inflate the cuff, then the cuff, the hose, all the valves in the system have to be able to be sealed. And to make it really safe, we have to have the safety relief valve have a normal condition of open so that when you power up the patient monitor before you start a blood pressure measurement, that safety valve is open. So you'll never ever seal your cuff and actually be able to inflate it all the way and hold that pressure without uh, act, being able to act on or just change the state of the safety relief valve. The way you do that is by going into the calibration screen for NIVP in the patient monitor service mode, and that's how you get access to be able to control that relief valve so that you can seal the vessel, so you can inflate the cuff and the pressure, and, let your, and, and, and make the static pressure level comparisons at each of several different settings or pressure levels that you're going to compare. You can't just do one or two. You really need to do several more than that in the process. Now, many of the manufacturers whose service manuals we've looked at do a pretty good job of picking plenty of uh, static pressure level points for you to do the comparison with, and will want you to do that when you do the calibration of their, of their medical device or that portion of their medical device. Others just give you uh, dynamic simulation pressures to run, and the problem with that is those really only are going to give you repeatability. They cannot give you accuracy because there's too many variables that you cannot control. They are all variables within the algorithm and how the algorithm responds to the pressure transducer in its measure, measurement system. And that doesn't, it means it doesn't matter how you generate the pressure, whether the pressure is coming from a patient or the pressure is coming from your simulator, if it's a dynamic simulation or dynamic pressure situation, you cannot control the variables and you can't really make that assessment properly. So and the organization, International Organization of Legal Metrology has weighed in on this. And this is built now, should be built into the standards, and I think it is by now. And what they said was about uh, non-invasive automated 
um, sphygmomanometers or, or pressure ma blood pressure measurement systems um, is that an NIVT patient simulator is not, can't really be used for testing the accuracy if it's just a dynamic simulation. But it's required in assessing the stability of the performance of the NIVT monitor. So what we want and what we've created in any of the tests uh, test tools that you've been able to get from Fluke Biomedical or the legacy companies in any of our pl blood pressure measurement uh, uh, testing systems is the ability to do static pressure levels, whether generated with the pressure generated by the patient monitor or the pressure being generated by the, the simulator or even a, a, a squeeze bulb with a valve. Any one of those will work. All that we need to do is be able to seal the system and make the pressures hold at each of the levels long enough. Well, so that works really well because that's exactly the way that we leak test the system. So we can identify leaks. If the leak is too great, you won't be able to make the accuracy assessment. So there's guidance for that given by each patient monitoring company in the service manual in the calibration procedure. So that's where you need to look, not just in the functional test procedure, but in your calibration procedure. Be sure you look there. The dynamic simulation, therefore, once we've checked the accuracy of the, of the patient monitor uh, NIVP measurement system and its transducer in its response to static pressure levels, once we're sure about that, then we can run dynamic simulation and we should get a pretty good result. But even then, the monitor may pick a peak pressure in the cuff that is not the same as what was, what was originally used. So you're still going to get some variables that you really can't control. Just understand that whatever you, this is about, not about accuracy. The dynamic simulation is now about repeatability. So if I send 120 over 80, even if I get 125 over something close to 80, um, I don't care as long as every time I send 120 over 80, I always get the same result that I got the first time. That's repeatability. And that's what dynamic simulation can give you. But it cannot give you accuracy. Don't ever think that that's accuracy. It has nothing to do with accuracy. If you have any question about how far off your simulation is, the first thing you need to do is go back and do the static pressure comparisons. Now, we have also noted that in, if you remember, I'm going to go back a uh, couple of slides here. If you remember in our, in our uh, measurement here, the, this, the technique used in the system on the left is uh, a statistically determined uh, systolic and diastolic being, being a certain percentage of where the, the peak pressure or the mean arterial pressure is. That statistical sampling method is where we see most often this problem with the peak pressure being off left or right a little bit. And so what we've done in the ProSim 8 just to give you a little example and not to be too commercial here, I want you to understand what we've done. We've put something in there called envelope shift, which allows us to shift our peak pressure that we're sending from the simulator, left or right, a little bit to line it up better with what the patient monitor is picking as its peak pressure. And when you do that, you get a much better dynamic simulation. It's much closer. But once again, has nothing to do with accuracy. It's only about repeatability and satisfying what we see when we look at the, what the monitors come up with on the display screen. That's really what it's all about. So if you have more questions about that, we'll be happy to cover those with you individually uh, or just type in your question uh, into the chat and we'll, and we'll address it. But here's a little picture that shows our um, both our newest uh, simulator, ProSim 8, and uh, also shows BP Pump 2 um, and how it was connected. BP Pump 2, in this case, is being uh, controlled by Answer software and a template. 
um, but it's making the measurement and doing the measurements in accordance with the, uh, the functional and safety testing of the patient monitor of the NIVP system that you see there. So we really want a vessel that would be the cuff and the hoses and any valves or, or systems inside the patient monitor so that we can pressurize, properly pressurize it so we can control as many of the variables as possible in making the measurement of NIVP. So what we've covered today fairly quickly is the blood pressure and how, uh, how blood pressure happens overall in the physiology of the patient. We've talked about um, hypertension and what that is um, and what some of the levels are from actual medical diagnosis. And then we've talked about the NIVP monitoring technologies kind of at a high level. Auscultatory meaning listening with a stethoscope and pressurizing with a, a squeeze bulb and a valve. And um, then we also talked about the oscillometric method. And the traditional oscillometric method does a stair-step uh, release of the pressure in the cuff to, in order to come up with the calculation, with the peak pressure and the calculation of the systolic and diastolic, either by a point-slope calculus method underlying the algorithm or a statistical uh, analysis of the peak pressure in the cuff uh, as, uh, as we talked about. And then we talked a little bit about how do we try and make that dynamic simulation a little bit more close and control some of the variables. When we have the point, the, um, the statistical analysis point, that's when the, the envelope shift of prosimate is the most useful. And you'll find that, that you'll want to do it. There's an application note that talks about how you experimentally come up with how much shift left or right you need to use for a particular brand and model of NIVP. That uh, does a really great job of explaining it. Let me tell you, we get a lot of questions and a lot of requests for us to do provide more examples of that envelope shift. And I'll tell you, that's why we wrote the application note. So it, you can do your own experimental determination of envelope shift, how much left or right. Remember, please, it is not about accuracy. The envelope shift is there to help your dynamic simulation be a little bit closer and help it match up with the way the monitor is doing the measurement, especially when it's doing a statistical sample kind of at the foundation of its algorithm. So I hope that helps you a little bit understand more about NIVP. As I promised, uh, we're doing some more uh, of our own uh, in investigation to come up with a better uh, explanation of, uh, of the um, measurement of blood pressure on the inflation of the cuff as opposed to the deflation. And we'll come back to you with more information about that as, as we're able to come up with it. If any of you have some pointers for us, hey, we're always happy to receive that information. You can just send it through to us at flukebiomedical.com. If you want more, yep, if you want more, we have more on-demand training on uh, the Advantage Training Center on our website. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay, thank you, Jerry, so much for that. We've got a few questions that have come in during the presentation, and we've got some time left to get to them. So we want to tell everyone out there, if we don't get to your question today, not to worry. Fluke will get a copy of all the questions submitted to follow up with you directly. But while we still have some time, uh, the first one that came through, why should the accuracy of NIBP be the only uh, uh, statistic pressure level comparisons that doctors or nurses judge the patient monitor NIBP accuracy? Well, so the, uh, we get it. The doctor and the nurse is, is responding to their impression of, um, the, of, of the measurement that they're seeing uh, from the patient based on what they hear by listening to Karakoff sounds and what they see on the patient monitor display. 
and if their impression of the patient's health and approximation, approximation of what the patient pressure should be is a little different than what they see on the, on the monitor screen, then, then they're going to call you and they're going to say, hey, I, I, don't, I don't trust this monitor measurement. Um, show me how, how, why I should trust this. That's really what they're saying. And so your typical approach is going to be uh, bringing your simulator, your dynamic simulation up there and having them look at it. And they may or may not trust it. So uh, one of the other ways to do it, as I said, is to let them listen as the patient monitor is making its assessment, either using the patient or using your dynamic simulation. Either one will work. The dynamic simulation uh, may give them a, an instrumented uh, uh, view of the, the measurement and may give them a little bit more confidence. But they need to listen while the measurement is being made on the same limb to the same blood vessel as is being occluded. Otherwise, all bets are off because anatomically and physiologically, your leg blood pressures are different than your arm blood pressures, and each side of you is different from the other side of you. They just are. That's facts of life. And sometimes our clinicians don't remember the facts of life. Uh, and what they're, uh, they don't always remember their training because they've been trained about that part. So uh, that's why I always like to let them listen. The static pressures always will give us a better assessment or really the only best assessment of accuracy because we're able to control the variables that need to be controlled. Dynamic simulation puts too many more variables in, most of which we cannot control. And if you have, are, are not able to control the variables on a measurement, then it cannot give you an accuracy uh, assessment. It just cannot. So that's why the order, uh, International Organization of Legal Metrology weighed in and said, look, do static pressure comparisons for accuracy, and then go ahead and use your dynamic simulation all right, but understand that's only going to give us repeatability uh, information. That's all. OK, thank you, Jerry. Another question that has come through, what if the systolic and diastolic pressure values displayed on the monitor are far different from the set values on the simulator? If they're, if they're far different, then it's time to run the, the static pressure comparisons. You need to do a calibration on that device because um, far different means we may have a pressure transducer problem. We may have some problem in the, in the firmware or in some active component on a circuit board. So you really need to troubleshoot that. And uh, if it were me, if I was called up to a clinical unit and I saw that situation, probably what I'm going to do is replace that patient monitor or blood pressure section of that monitor and take that uh, down to the shop and do a little bit more deep troubleshooting on it, beginning with and a, a static pressure comparison for accuracy. Excellent. OK, another question. Isn't there a way to make the dynamic simulation produce a pressure display on the monitor that is closer to the simulated value? Yeah, we described our, uh, our, our newest functionality there, the envelope shift, and, uh, and how you use it and when it is most useful. So just to repeat that, um, the, the envelope shift is most useful when you have a patient monitor whose blood pressure calculation or measurement algorithm is based on a statistical analysis, kind of like the, um, the, the, the height method, right? So uh, the, the app note that we have available for you that you can find right on our website um, helps you understand how the envelope shift works and it helps you understand how you may experimentally come up with uh, a determine a, the, the experimental amount of left or right envelope shift for a particular branded model of NIVP. Okay. The next question we have here, you mentioned normal and high BP. So what is low BP? 
So low blood pressure would be really anything, um, let's see, my, my wife has diagnosed with low blood pressure and she typically returns uh, uh, systolic and diastolic of around 115 over like, uh, uh, over like as low as 70 uh, or 75. That's pretty low, but she's consistent and over time the doctors determined that she's just one of those people that has real relaxed blood vessels that, you know, kind of don't produce a lot of resistance and that's why the blood pressure is lower. Uh, but it can be alarming if the blood pressure of a patient has been higher for a while and then suddenly becomes low. That has a lot of different physiologic implications and it could be more problems with the heart itself and not so much with, uh, with the blood vessels. So they, they really do need to, to see a doctor. But it's, it's really kind of that low, kind of in that range. Okay, thank you. Another question that has come through, why can I never get the exact same reading of NIBP when using different NIBP machines? Well, that's because each algorithm, and particularly in brand and model difference, uh, differences from one device under test to the next, are, every one of, each one of those has usually a different algorithm. Uh, because we have different engineers on projects, different projects at different times. Uh, just in the same company, me medical device manufacturer, they may have some variation in the algorithm itself and how it's done. And there are different pressure sensors over time. That's, uh, that Andrew reminded me of that. That's really uh, a really important determination. The blood pressure sensors, the pressure sensors that are used in the blood pressure measurement designs have improved over time. So if you have a very old patient monitor, brand and model, and you're comparing it to a newer brand and model, even of the same manufacturer, the components that they had available to select in their design implementation is different uh, over the years. In fact, even in the usable life of a patient monitor, there may be changes in that particular component because that component may have gone obsolete or may not be available and you have to pick a different one to be able to use. Now, when that happens, the medical device manufacturer's responsibility is to do, do another validation test on the different component. Uh, but you will notice differences because you're looking at older stuff compared to newer stuff. Yeah, you may find that you, it just is an indicator that you may need to do a calibration on that NIVP system. Okay, very good. Well, I think uh, we've probably gotten to the end of time for questions. A reminder to everyone on the call that Fluke and Jerry and Andrew will get a copy of the questions submitted even if we didn't get a chance to address them during today's presentation. We want to go ahead and thank Jerry and Andrew and thank again today's sponsor, Fluke Biomedical. One lucky attendee will win lunch for their whole department. Details are included in the post-webinar survey, which will appear on your screen shortly. You must complete the survey to obtain your certificate of attendance. If you do not see the survey, please email us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great week.